Hello listeners, this is the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth and final quarter of 2022. The series is titled On Death, Dying and the Future Hope. The author is Dr Alberto Tim, while your readers are Percy and Sibella Harold. Welcome to lesson number 14, ready for teaching on December 31. It's titled All Things New and I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, December 24. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that there's going to be everything new when Jesus comes, when heaven becomes the place where we live. We thank you that because of the prophecies, we understand a bit about what will happen in the future. But what we really do know is that we will be with Jesus because of what he did for us on the cross. Each of us can have access to your throne. Each of us can have eternal life and each of us can have the opportunity of dwelling in the place where Jesus is. And Lord, as we open your word this week, we just want to thank you again. We want your Holy Spirit to guide us and bless us as we look at all things new. And today I'd like to pray for those who are listening in Cyprus, in Dominica, in in England, in the Falkland Islands, in the lower part of the Atlantic Ocean, in Fiji or Gambia or Ghana or Gibraltar or Granada or Guernsey or Guyana or India, or Jamaica, or Jersey, or Kenya. Lord, wherever people are listening, and we know that they're listening from many, many countries around the world, I pray that you'll bless each of us, and particularly be with those who are vision impaired, Lord, that these words that I'm reading this week will be a blessing to them. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Revelation chapter 21 and verse 5. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Let's read that again. Revelation 21 verse 5. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Scripture gives us this hope, but according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 13 in the New American Standard Bible. For some, however, the promise of a new heaven and a new earth of Revelation 21 verse 1 seems like a fantasy. Stories told by those in power who used the hope of an afterlife to help keep the masses in line. The idea being, though you have it hard at present, one day you will have your reward in heaven, or the like. And though some people have used the future hope presented in the Bible that way, their abuse doesn't change the truth of the promises that we have regarding the new heavens and the new earth. In the last days, scoffers will ridicule our blessed hope, we read in 2 Peter 3, 3 3-7. But their scoffing, just as predicted, could be just as more evidence that what the Bible says is true. For they are scoffing as the Bible predicted they would. So let's read 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 to 7, knowing this verse, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly forget, that, By the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. During this week, we will reflect on the glorious promise of a new heaven and a new earth including the heavenly temple, the presence of God, the end of death and tears, and finally, the ultimate triumph of God's love.
Sunday, December 25, a new heaven and a new earth. For some followers of Greek philosophy, the idea that something is physical means that it is bad. That's why for them it is unconceivable to think of a real heaven with real people in the future. In this thinking, for it to be heaven and to be good, it must be a purely spiritual state, free from the blemishes found in the physical world here. If something is material, they assert, it cannot be spiritual, and if something is spiritual, it cannot be material. By contrast, the Bible speaks of heaven in concrete terms, but without the limitations imposed by the presence of sin. Read Isaiah 65 verses 17 to 25, Isaiah 66, 22 and 23, 2 Peter 3, 13 and Revelation 21 verses 1 to 5. What is the ultimate message of these passages? Isaiah 65 beginning at verse 17, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice for ever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing, and her people a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem, and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. No more shall an infant from there live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die one hundred years old, but the sinner, being one hundred years old, shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree, so shall be the days of my people. And my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labour in vain, nor bring forth children for trouble. For they shall be the descendants of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, and dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. And Isaiah 66, verses 22 and 23, For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain, and it shall come to pass, that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. And Second Peter chapter 3, verse 13, Nevertheless we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, in which righteousness dwells. And Revelation 21, verses 1 to 5, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. The book of Isaiah provides interesting glimpses of how the earth would have been if Israel as a nation had remained faithful to their covenant with God. And we read that in Isaiah 65 and in Isaiah 66. And now we need to compare that with Deuteronomy 28. And it's titled here, uh, I'll just read the first 14 verses, because that's the blessings of obedience. Now it came to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. 
and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, the produce of your ground, and the increase of your herds, the increase of your cattle, and the offspring of your flocks. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing on you in your storehouses and in all to which you set your hand, and he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself, just as he has sworn to you if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. Then all peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. And the Lord will grant you plenty of goods in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, and in the produce of your ground, in the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain in your land in its season, and to bless all the work of your hand. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You shall be above only and not be beneath if you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and are careful to observe them. So you shall not turn aside from any of the words which I command you this day, to the right or to the left, to go after other gods to serve them. The whole environment, with its various expressions of life, would have grown more and more toward God's original plan, that is, before the entrance of sin. However, that plan did not materialise as expected. Then a new plan was established. But now, with the church, composed of Jews and Gentiles from all nations, as we read in Matthew 28 and 1 Peter chapter 2, the prophecies of Isaiah, therefore, have to be re-read from the perspective of the church. And so let's look at Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, and 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Matthew 28, beginning at verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. And First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. And then we're asked to read Second Peter 3, 13 and Revelation 21, verses 1 to 5, which we did earlier in response to the question. From The Great Controversy, page 675, we read, In the Bible, the inheritance of the saved is called a country. Hebrews 14, sorry, Hebrews 11, 14 to 16. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And we continue with the page 675 of the Great Controversy. There the heavenly shepherd leads his flock to fountains of living waters. The tree of life yields its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the service of the nations. There are ever-flowing streams, clear as crystal, and beside them waving trees cast their shadows upon the paths prepared for the ransomed of the Lord. There the wide-spreading plains swell into hills of beauty, and the mountains of God rear their lofty summits. On those peaceful plains, besides those living streams, 
God's people, so long pilgrims and wanderers, shall find a home. End of quote. And so to finish today, many secular writers, without the hope of eternity as presented in Scripture, have lamented the meaninglessness of human existence. Though they are wrong about the future, why is it hard to argue with their point about the meaninglessness of life without a future hope? Bring your answer to class on Sabbath. Monday, December 26, in the Temple of God. Some people speak of heaven itself as being God's sanctuary. But the book of Revelation refers to a specific sanctuary or temple within the New Jerusalem, where God's throne and the sea of glass are located. We read about this in Revelation 4, verses 2 to 6. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne, in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and on the thrones I saw twenty-four elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. And Revelation 7 verses 9 to 15 will actually cover with the question coming up in about 40 seconds time. And Revelation 15 verses 5 to 8. After these things I looked and behold the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And out of the temple came the seven angels, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, and having their chests girded with golden bands. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God, who lives for ever and ever. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. There the great multitude of saints from all nations, tribes and peoples and tongues will worship God for ever. And we refer again to Revelation chapter 7, and this time I'm going to read verses 16 and 17. They shall neither hunger any more nor thirst any more, the sun shall not strike them nor any heat, for the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Compare Revelation chapter 7 verses 9 to 15 with Revelation 21 verses 3 and 22. How can we harmonise the description of the great multitude of the redeemed serving God day and night in his temple, as it says in Revelation 7.15, with the statement that John saw no temple in the New Jerusalem in Revelation 21 verse 22? So first of all, Revelation 7 verses 9 to 15. After these things I looked, and behold... A great multitude which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne, and the elders and the four living creatures, and fell on their faces before the throne, and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honour and power and might, be to our God for ever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and 
where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. And Revelation 21 verse 3, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them, and be their God. I actually read that text yesterday, the day before I recorded this lesson, at the funeral of my sister-in-law. That was on the 21st of August, 2022. And then verse 22. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are in its temple. The heavenly sanctuary, or temple, has always been the place where the heavenly hosts worship God. But, with the appearance of sin, that sanctuary also became the place from which salvation is offered to humanity. When, and this is a quote, when the sin problem is over, the heavenly sanctuary will once again revert to its original function. In Revelation 21.22, John the Revelator reports that he no longer saw a temple in the city, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. But, does that mean there is no longer a house of the Lord, where his creatures can come and have special fellowship with him? By no means, writes Richard M. Davison from an article, The Sanctuary, to Behold the Beauty of the Lord, in Arthur Steely's edited The Word Searching Living Teaching, Volume 1, published by the Biblical Research Institute at Silver Spring, Maryland, in 2015, and that was on page 31. The book of Revelation gives special attention to the one who is being worshipped and to those who are worshipping him. This heavenly worship is centred on God and the Lamb, as we read in Revelation 5.13 and Revelation 7 and verse 10. Revelation 5.13 reads, And every creature which is in heaven, and on the earth, and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing, and honour, and glory, and power be to him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb, for ever and ever. And Revelation 7 verse 10, And crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. As always, and as it should be, Christ is the focus of the worship. The worshippers are those who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb, we read in Revelation 7.14. They are living witnesses of God's redeeming and transforming power. They sing praises to God for who He is and for what He did for them. And so to finish today, Revelation 21 verse 3 reads, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. This verse reflects numerous other passages, such as Jeremiah 32, verse 38, They shall be my people, and I will be their God. And also Ezekiel 37, verse 27, My tabernacle also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And Zechariah 8, verse 8, I will bring them back, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. They shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and righteousness, and in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. What does it mean for us now, still here on earth, that God will be our God, and we will be his people. How do we live out this amazing truth now?
Tuesday, December 27, in the presence of God. The Bible says that God dwells in unapproachable light in 1 Timothy 6 verse 16 and that no one has ever seen God. We read in John 1.18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. And 1 John chapter 4 and verse 12, no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. Does it mean that the saints in heaven will never see God the Father? Not at all. It is quite evident that not seeing God refers to the human beings after the fall, because there are several indications in Scripture that the saints will actually see Him in heaven. Read Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, 1 John 3, 2 and 3, and Revelation 22, 3 and 4. What do these passages tell us about the supreme privilege of seeing God? Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone that has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. And Revelation 22, verses 3 and 4. And there shall be no more curse, for the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. The same Apostle John, who states that no one has ever seen God in John 18 and 1 John 4, verse 12, also declares that we shall see him as he is in 1 John 3, 2 and 3, and see his face in Revelation 22, verses 3 and 4. It can be debatable whether these passages refer to God the Father or to Christ, but all doubts are gone in light of Christ's own statement, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God in Matthew 5, verse 8. What a privilege it will be for the redeemed to worship God in his temple. But the supreme privilege of all will be to see his face. In the Great Controversy, pages 676 and 677, we read, The people of God are privileged to hold open communion with the Father and the Son. Now we see through a glass darkly, we read in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, we behold the image of God reflected as in a mirror in the works of nature and in his dealings with men, but then we shall see him face to face without a dimming veil between. We shall stand in his presence and behold the glory of his countenance. End of quote. Notice in some of the verses for today the link between purity and seeing God. The pure in heart will see God. He who sees God purifies himself just as he is pure in 1 John 3.3. 3. What these verses reveal is that God must do a work in us now to help prepare us for heaven. Though in the end our title to heaven has been made certain through the death of Jesus, we will go through a purifying process here and now that will help prepare us for our eternal home. And central to the purification process is obedience to his word. And so to finish today, read 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 22. How does this text reveal to us the link between obedience and purification? Let's read the text, 1 Peter 1, 22. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. What is it about obedience that purifies us? How specifically does Peter say our obedience will be made manifest?
Wednesday, December 28, No More Death and Tears The theory of an immortal soul, suffering forever in an ever-burning hell, contradicts the biblical teaching that, in the new heaven and the new earth, there will be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, as it says in Revelation 21 verse 4. If the theory of an eternal burning hell were true, then the second death would not eradicate sin and sinners from the universe, but only confine them in an everlasting hell of sorrow and crying. And further, in this case, the universe would never be fully restored to its original perfection. But praise the Lord that the Bible paints a completely different picture. Read Isaiah chapter 25, verse 8, Revelation 7, 17, and Revelation 21, verse 4. What comfort and hope can these passages bring us amid the trials and suffering of this present world? Isaiah 25, verse 8. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. The rebuke of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. And Revelation 7, verse 17. For the Lamb, who is in the midst of the throne, will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And Revelation 21 and verse 4, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Life can be very hard, unfair, and cruel. Some people, so dear to us, are brutally taken away by the cold embrace of death. Or some people come subtly into our lives, steal our feelings, and then walk away as if nothing ever happened. How terrible it is to be betrayed by someone whom we loved and trusted. There are moments when, with a broken heart, we may even wonder if life is worth living. Regardless of our sorrows, however, God is always eager to wipe away from our cheeks as much tears as possible. But, some of our heaviest tears will continue streaming down until that glorious day when death, sorrow and crying will cease to exist, as we read in that glorious passage in Revelation 21 verses 1 to 5. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying." There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. We can trust that in the final judgment, God will treat every single human being with fairness and love. All our loved ones who died in Christ will be raised from the dead to be with us throughout eternity. Those unworthy of eternal life will finally cease to exist without having to live in an unpleasant heaven or in an ever-burning hell. Our greatest comfort derives from the fair way God treats everyone. When death definitely ceases to exist, the redeemed will shout joyfully, Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? 1 Corinthians 15, verses 54 and 55. The Lord promised that in the new heaven and the new earth he would create, the former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. Isaiah 65, verse 17. This does not mean that heaven will be a place of amnesia, but rather that the past will not undermine the enduring joy of heaven.
And so to finish today, who hasn't felt the unfair ravages of human existence here, especially in those bad times? How can we learn to trust and to the degree possible rejoice in God's goodness and love? Thursday, December 29. His name on their foreheads. Read Revelation chapter 22, verses 3 to 5. How can we be assured that we will be among those who will have the name of God written on their foreheads? Or can we be assured? Revelation 22, beginning at verse 3. And there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There will be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign for ever and ever. After the rebellion of Lucifer and the fall of Adam and Eve, God could have destroyed the two sinners. Yet, as an expression of unconditional love for his creatures, God established a merciful plan to save those who accept what he offers. This is what is known as the plan of salvation, which, though existing even before the creation on earth, was first presented to humanity in Eden right after the fall. And there are some indications that it was there before the creation of the earth, as we read in Ephesians 1, verses 3 and 4, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And Second Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. And Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie, promised before time began. And Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life, or the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It was then further revealed in the types and shadows of the Hebrew sanctuary service, which we read about in Exodus chapter 25. And then it was given its fullest expression in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus in Romans chapter 5. Let's begin at verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more... Having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, 
and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who was a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offence. For if by one man's offence many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift was not like that which came through the one who sinned, for the judgment which came from one offence resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offences resulted in justification. For if by the one man's offence death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Therefore, through one man's offence, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offence might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. At the centre of the plan of salvation is the promise of eternal life, based on the merits of Jesus, to all who accept by faith the great provision supplied at the cross. Before the cross, after the cross, salvation has always been by faith and never by works, however much works are an expression of our salvation. Paul wrote about Abraham, who existed long before the coming of Christ, as an example of salvation by faith. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God, we read in Romans 4, 2 and 3. It continues, For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. How do these verses help us understand what salvation by faith is all about. Thus, we can have the assurance of salvation if we have accepted Jesus, have surrendered to him and have claimed his promises, including those of a new life now in him, and if we lean totally on his merits and nothing else. Abraham believed, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. It works the same with us. This, then, is what it means to have his name written on our foreheads. If we have it written there now and don't turn away from him, then it will be written there in the new heavens and the new earth as well. Friday, December 30. From the book The Great Controversy, page 651, we read, The cross of Christ will be the science and the song of the redeemed through all eternity. In Christ glorified, they will behold Christ crucified. Never will it be forgotten that he whose power created and upheld the unnumbered worlds through the vast realms of space, the beloved of God, the majesty of heaven, he whom cherub and shining seraph delighted to adore, humbled himself to uplift fallen man, that he bore the guilt and shame of sin and the hiding of his father's face till the woes of the lost world broke his heart and crushed out his life on Calvary's cross, that the maker of all worlds, the arbiter of all destinies, should lay aside his glory and humiliate himself from love to man will ever excite the wonder and adoration of the universe. End of quote. 
and from page 678 of the same book, The Great Controversy is Ended, Sin and Sinners Are No More, The Entire Universe is Clean, One Pulse of Harmony and Gladness Beats Through the Vast Creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness throughout the realms of illimitable space. From the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things, animate and inanimate, in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy, declare that God is love. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One. Many secularized Christians live their lives as if this world will last forever, as in Luke 12, verses 16 to 21. And that reads, Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain man, a certain rich man, yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then Whose will these things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. How can we balance our earthly ideals with our heavenly priorities? How can we guard against what Jesus has warned us about in Luke chapter 12? And question two, if heaven begins here, what should we do to transform our homes and our personal lives into little expressions of heavenly principles? And three, on the question asked at the end of Sunday's study, what is the logic behind the pessimism of those who don't believe in eternal life? At the same time, too, some of these people nevertheless seem to live fairly happy lives, even without expressing any future hope. How do you think they do that? That is, how might they rationalise living, even contentedly, without the promise of something beyond this life? And now for Inside Story, a mission story with Sibella. Thank you, Sibella. Influential juice bar in Fiji by George Kwong. Wailolo Beach is a popular tourist destination known for affordable lodging, restaurants and especially bars and night spots in Nadi, Fiji. But when COVID-19 struck, many small cafes, fast food outlets and restaurants lost business along the beach. One such place was the Bamboo Resort. Sensing an opportunity, three local Seventh-day Adventist churches teamed up with Bamboo Resort to open Batu Wellness Bar, a juice bar offering health and wellness programs such as free biometric screenings, exercise programs, fat loss challenges and personalised meal plans. The bar, whose name Batu means bamboo in the local language, quickly gained popularity among the locals who streamed in for healthy fresh juices daily. Church members prayed that the bar would serve as a centre of influence to encourage Fijians to take a more holistic approach toward health in a region where people struggled with lifestyle diseases, particularly diabetes. The bar, supported by the South Pacific Division's 10,000 Toes campaign, a recipient of a 2019 13 Sabbath offering, also sought to raise awareness about healthy alternatives to alcohol. But then a second wave of COVID-19 struck Fiji, and the authorities ordered that the Bamboo Resort shut down, along with the juice bar. For two weeks, customers called daily to find out when and where the juice bar would reopen. What happened next surprised everyone. A married couple, who managed the neighbouring Beach Escape Resort, had watched crowds pouring in and out of the Bamboo Resort daily, and had noticed that more people visited the juice bar than the liquor bar. They also noted with satisfaction a decrease in alcohol-related incidents on their street. 
the couple contacted church members and offered the use of their liquor bar and other premises as a wellness club. Church members initially declined the offer, not wanting to offer fruit juice in the same place as alcohol. But the managers explained that they wanted to stop selling alcohol altogether. Alcohol was cleared out and bar equipment was replaced with juicing machines, blenders, fruits and vegetables and herbs. The Bature Wellness Bar was up and running again. Church members expressed amazement at the marvellous way that God leads. The juice bar has not only influenced the patrons of the Bamboo Resort, but it has also transformed the Beach Escape Resort into a centre of influence that is bringing hope and healing to the community. This lesson was read by Dr Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful.